Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be talking about how to protect data and what we did to accomplish that mission. So quick introduction. My name is Joe Vaughn. I'm from Uber. I'm a security engineer. Uh, what I like to do is hang out with my two kids. They're pretty much monsters, but I love them. I also like spicy food and rehabbing gross properties and make them look good. My co-presenter, his name is Debo. He's a pretty smart guy. He really enjoys cooking and eating. He's okay at tennis, and he likes to beat up his computers in his spare time and make them do things they shouldn't do. So why are we here? Like we said, we're gonna be talking about message protection. And so what you'll see on the screen is our agenda. And at a high level, how do we actually accomplish this? Essentially what I like to do is frame a story of how we looked at protecting messages and how we took this idea, looked at what was out there, changed that up for our environment, and then actually implemented a solution. And then along the way, we'll talk about some of the challenges we faced and what we're gonna do in the future. So let's start with the beginning. What exactly is message level encryption? So message level encryption is kind of a vague or broad term, but let's just scope this down a little bit so we can talk about this problem and how we intend to solve it. At Uber, we handle lots of data ranging from someone's address, someone's name, their phone number, all the way up to their health data. Correspondingly, we handle credit card information and also government identifiers. For us, it's extremely important to make sure this data is protected as it goes throughout our network. What we'll also like to talk about is how does that, what are the impacts of message level encryption? Where do we decide to implement message level encryption and how it's actually helped us in our environment? So what are we trying to do? Um, we, we had this notion of sensitive data. I think every large organization, even small organizations, handles sensitive data. What do you do with it? We've all seen these, these uh, news articles and, and stories in the news where this large organization was hacked and someone got to their database and then all the passwords were there or all the credit card numbers were there in plain text. So we don't want to be in that situation. So well, what are we trying to accomplish? One of the goals here is to protect our sensitive data at rest. And that means a lot of things, but for us, it means protecting our data as it's stored in our data stores and as it moves through our logging systems. The second goal of this solution is to make sure it's secure. So while we can do encryption arbitrarily, what we'd like to do is do proper encryption, proper crypto. So do we use AES, CBC, or EBC, or do we use more authenticated encryptions such as AES, GCM? Um, in addition to that, how do we choose same defaults for the algorithms and also the key material that support those algorithms? Thirdly, we want a simple API. The reason we want a simple API, API is because we want our developers and engineers to use this product and not have any issues with it. And what do I mean by that? If, if crypto is too complex, that means there's more opportunity to make a mistake or make an error. If there's too many knobs and configuration devices, that means someone might make a configuration choice that would have adverse effects to their data and to their service. And so what we want to do is make it very simple for our engineers to spend time doing the work that they do and then be able to encrypt data in a very easy manner. Last, we want to make sure that there is scalability, flexibility, and adaptability. Let's just bucket that into something called agility. So we kind of want to look around the corner. So in the future, let's say the algorithm we chose today is no longer the algorithm we, want, algorithm we want to use later. Can the solution adapt to that? Also, can it be performant to handle various workloads and various work sizes? So we talked about it, the, the solution being simple. And one of the reasons I want to bring that up is to show this example. What we see here is a really small code snippet of someone encrypting information and they're passing in a key, a nonce, and the plain text itself. What you'll see highlighted on the screen is that the, per the user is passing in the nonce, the same nonce, twice. And so this is definitely a security issue. You should not be using the same nonce with a corresponding key. Now, I know that the standard library from all the different languages say don't do this. However, it's still an option. 
the developer can still choose to do this, whether it's unintentional or, or they're in a rush and they need to do this. And so what we want to do is, is make this decision for the developer. So they don't need to think about, oh, what nonce do I use? What size do I use? Do I have to use a different nonce? Do I need to encrypt the nonce? Some of these questions are, are, are not really applicable, but if you don't have that context, you'll, you'll get stuck. The second thing to notice is at the bottom, we have this encrypt function, it's very generic. However, the encrypt API is pretty simple looking, right? At first glance, you pass it a couple of parameters, it does its thing, and then you get back ciphertext. But underneath the hood, as a developer, which mode do I choose? If I'm using symmetric encryption in AES, should I be using CVC, GCM? What key size should I use? Do I use a nonce or an IV? What's the difference? And then what kind of strategy do I use? Do I need to compress and then encrypt? Do I need to Mac and then encrypt? Which one should I choose? And so talking about making something simple and reducing the friction for a developer to onboard is why we want to make some of these choices for them and make sane defaults. So we talked about some goals, we showed an example. Now let's move a little bit more to the requirements. So we, we handle this sensitive data and we have requirements from third parties. One of the third parties that we have, just like other organizations, are compliance regulations. So for example, we all know PCI, some of us have heard about PSD2, GDPR. So whatever this means is like, since we're handling this sensitive data, we need to protect it in a certain manner, whether that's at rest or in, in transit. Another requirement is we, we touched on earlier about this agility notion. So we have to have this ability to move the algorithm, the, the key size, different components without having to rework the entire application. And so in our search for choosing a solution, these are some of the things we kept in mind. Thirdly, we need to figure out how we're gonna handle the key. So the key can come from multiple sources. It could be a local source, or it can be from a, a key management system like AWS or, or Vault. And whatever solution we choose has to interoperate between these different key management solutions. Lastly, if someone cannot access their data, we're in a really bad situation because it's quite easy to encrypt something, but then how do you make sure that data is always available for an authorized user? So combining these goals and requirements, we needed a, a solution that was easy to onboard, easy to use, secure, and reliable. Before we explain the process that we use to review the different solutions, let's take a quick look at, at what the Uber service graph looks like. And what I want to highlight here is this craziness that you see on the screen is, is indicative of Uber. It's indicative of our infrastructure. It's indicative of the, the different mobile apps, the different backend services, the web apps, the, the operational apps, the data handling apps. All these different services that make up the Uber machine are depicted in some, in, in some fashion here. Um, all these systems somehow communicate with each other. So what does that really mean? That means that when data, such as someone entering their social security number, enters our network from a mobile app, it's gonna traverse through different systems to ultimately get to that data store where it resides. And so how do we make sure that this data is, is all secure through the entire um, journey as it gets to the data store? Another thing to consider is, in addition to this complex environment, we also have business functionality requirements where an operator, and what an operator is, is let's call it like a customer service agent. If I'm a user and I have a problem, I call up an operator and they kind of give me help. Um, and so in, in this example, let's say I'm a driver and the customer service agent or operator needs access to my driver information to, to give me assistance. So that operator needs to be able to see some sensitive data. Additionally, data analysts, how do we know how many trips we're gonna have or, or project how many trips we're gonna have in a given area? They need to know trip data. Um, another example would be our engineers. Let's say we're debugging our, our ride app or our driving app, and we need access to the event system, the log system. Sometimes there's sensitive data there. So we, we talk about this to then ask the question, how do we enable this business functionality while protecting sensitive data, but also minimizing impact to our existing infrastructure? Some of the ways we thought about this was like, well, do we just implement mutual TLS all throughout our infrastructure? Do we use disk encryption? You know, what, what exactly do we use to, to solve this problem given our, our complexities in our environment? 
So what did we decide on is the notion of field level encryption. And what you'll see in this depiction here is you'll see one record from a data store and it's a user record. And let's just think about a user as having a first name, a last name, their age, their address, their SSN. This is a hypothetical example, but what I'm trying to drive the point home is that we have this, this large object and inside of this object, there are certain fields that are sensitive. Most of the time, the sensitivity is based on compliance or something around business logic. But in this example, let's say that address and SSN are the sensitive fields. So what we can do here is instead of encrypting the entire user object, we can encrypt certain fields within that user object. Some of the benefits of this is that we can now minimize performance costs because encryption is not free. It does, it does incur some performance penalties, but by encrypting certain fields instead of the entire object, we can minimize that impact. Additionally, if for whatever reason, we've had to send this data over an insecure communication channel, such as HTTP, we can do that now because this data is encrypted. This type of strategy is gonna help us defend against certain attacks, such as a disgruntled employee or some curious engineer trying to read the logs or manipulate the, the network packets. So we said that encryption is kind of easy. And what I mean to say is that it's, it's relatively straightforward. When you have encryption, when you're gonna do encryption, you pick a good algorithm, you pick the proper key size, the nonce size, and some of the other parameters, and you just encrypt that data. But what happens after that? What are the impacts of encrypting data? So some of the impacts have to do with performance, and some of the impacts have to do with the actual data itself. So when we talk about performance, we can break those down a bit further into latency and to th throughput. When we talk about latency, we're talking about the speed. Uh, the, and most services categorize speed in terms of uh, P99 latency. And so what that really means is that 99% of all operations for a given endpoint during a given time take at most X number of milliseconds. And let's give a concrete example to drive this home. Let's say you have this endpoint where you register a new user onto your site. And that endpoint has a P99 of 30 seconds, 30 milliseconds. What does that mean? That means 99% of the time for the last 24 hours, it's taken 30 milliseconds for that operation to complete. Okay, cool. So let's go back to our example when we had this user object. And now we wanna introduce this notion of field level encryption to the, to the user object. Some considerations that we need to make is are, where are the keys located? Let's say, for example, we store our keys remotely in this key management system. Well, if that's the case, then our latency is going to increase because now we need to make RPC calls to this KMS, authenticate to the KMS, retrieve the correct key, and also that KMS might do some auditing on their side or some operations on their side, such as logging that, that key request. Now that we have the key, we need to encrypt. So we say that encryption is not really free, so depending on what algorithm you choose, there are cycles involved in that as well. So there's time added overall. So what does that time really add up to? Is it five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds? In our example, we said our operation take, uh, took 30 milliseconds. So if we're adding 10 milliseconds, while that seems small, that's pretty significant for this scenario. And so it, what it really means is that these processes are, or this latency is tied very deeply to this specific service and contextually to the, um, the use case. Another thing to consider is a throughput. So in this example, throughput means size. So let's go back to our registering new user. Let's say that's done, the user's happy, and now we need to get information about the user. So let's say they're a driver and we need their driver's license and also their driver registration. So these are usually come in the form of images or PDF documents. And these documents could be varying in size. Some of them might be five megabytes, maybe 10 megabytes. And what that means is now we need to take this larger piece of data and we need to encrypt the entire thing. So again, that's increasing the amount of operations, increasing the size, and that's adding some complexity and stress on our infrastructure. So between latency and throughput, we might add so much latency, or so much time and duration to this operation where the user that was wanting to sign up is gonna get upset because now this process is taking too long, which ultimately leads to that person leaving our platform. So we don't want that. The other options are uh, data access and data migrations. 
So going back to that registered new user, uh, we, we added this user, we encrypted their information, and that information now lives in a user data store. Well, what happens when we have a customer service rep that needs to provide support for that user? So I'm a user, I call up, say, hey, listen, something's wrong with my account, I need help. Now that customer service rep needs access to that data. And in order to get access to that data, they need the key. So what do they do in order to get access to that key? And if they can't get access to the key, then they can't do their job. Kind of in parallel, we have this notion of data migrations. So if when we started this project, there were other solutions at Uber, whether they were homegrown or third-party products. Now, if in the database, we had multiple pieces of data that were encrypted with different schemes, what do we do with that? One option is to just have all these different encryption mechanisms coexist. But that would require to have this branching logic in all of our services. And that wouldn't be a very clean mechanism. So another option is just to decrypt the old data and then re-encrypt it with the new scheme. So now that we've talked about a couple of, of impacts and goals and requirements, now we can start evaluating solutions that can address this problem. So what we wanna do is talk about the ways we thought about addressing this problem. And a couple of things we need to consider. One is what are the threats that we're trying to solve here? Is it a user stealing, is, is it an attacker stealing a hard disk? Is it someone doing SQL injection? Is it a rogue DBA or, or engineer trying to get access to the system? And then how can we mitigate against it? Uh, in parallel, how complex is the solution? So just to kind of touch base, we still haven't decided on a solution yet, right? We're still, we're still contemplating solutions, whether we do it, whether we, we built it internally or whether we, we go to an existing third party. So let's dive a bit into how we looked at all of these approaches. Now, a little bit more specific on the approaches. One of the main considerations is where is encryption happening? So is it in the application level? Is it at the disk level, at the OS level? And what kind of security guarantees do we get based on that level? Another thing to consider is, are we using a KMS remotely or are the keys stored right next to the sensitive data? And as we go through that, let's start thinking about the trade-offs to figure out what's best for our approach. All right, so first up, what do we have? We have volume and disk encryption. So an example of this is, you know, the, the encryption that's on your file, on your file system, on your laptop or your server. And another example is BitLocker. So as long as your system can boot and you can mount that volume, you should be fine. So some of the good things about this is that this is transparent. It doesn't really um, cause any issues for the user. But at the same time, this doesn't really solve our threat model. The, this solves a threat model of someone stealing the physical hard drive or stealing the, 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 the volume. And that's not what we're going for here. So we're trying to solve for someone getting access to the data store or seeing data as it moves throughout the network. So we didn't use this option. Another option we considered is something called, um, I think, transparent disk encryption or data encryption. And this is included in a lot of different databases. So for example, you have this in MySQL. Now, what's cool about this is that it's transparent and all of your SQL queries still work. So let's say you have a, uh, a user service. If you enabled this database TDE, nothing would need to change with your application. All the changes would happen with your database. So what's actually happening underneath the hood is that it's encrypting the files, the files that support those tables. So the problem here is that we're still not really protecting against the use case that we want to protect against. This really just protects against someone stealing your disk. Um, additionally, the keys are stored, stored in the database. So a rogue D DBA or someone who gets access to the database could potentially steal the keys as well. We're still in the database, but now we have a little bit of stronger um, encryption. We have this thing called column level encryption. What MySQL does as an example is use enterprise encryption. Now, this one's pretty cool because now the keys are not stored locally in the database, or at least they don't have to be. They can be stored in a uh, KMS. So we're getting a little bit stronger with our security guarantees because now we're protecting against a rogue DBA and we have keys coming from a different source. Some of the issues that arise with this is that now we're going to have to start introducing code changes 
So there's a higher level of friction here. But at the same time, some of the, the implementations that we've seen used weaker algorithms. And we didn't really like that. So we still didn't, we didn't choose this choice either. So as we're walking a little higher up in the tech stack, we finally get to application layer. So app, application layer, the first one we'll talk about is server-side. So as, a, as an example, you can think of S3 server-side encryption. So what's good about this is that this is independent of a database. So we're not tied to the MySQL implementation or the Microsoft SQL implementation. And it's also fairly easy to onboard. Yes, there are going to be code changes, but those code changes are mainly adding an SDK or a library such that a service can make a API call. Any changes to the API happen on the API side, so your client library should still work. Um, some of the issues that arise here is that if an admin gets access to this S3 bucket, usually they can get access to the data that's housed there as well. So this is really only protecting against a rogue engineer who gets access there. Um, additionally, the keys, they can be stored either with the KMS or um, by the user themselves. And so we're, we're getting better security guarantees, but the friction is also increasing as well. Now, we still didn't like this choice because it wasn't as flexible as we wanted. We were still tied into the algorithms that were supported by the server-side technology, which leads us to the last option we considered. So the last option was client-side encryption. And as an example, you have Google Tink or you have AWS S3 client-side encryption. So with this one, we have the pros of, we could choose our algorithm, we could choose the key material, we can choose the controls that we wanted to use. But with that flexibility came those cons of, we had to make a lot of code changes. Additionally, we had to discover where sensitive data lives. So what that means is that we can do all these good things about creating an encryption system or using an existing one, but we need to figure out where sensitive data lives. Um, the good thing about this is that now we're protecting threats where we have a man in the middle or you have a rogue engineer. So in both of those primary threats, we're protecting against those now. Um, also, the keys, they can come from a legit KMS or we can, we can supply them as a user. Like I said, this friction is higher because there's more, um, there's more flexibility here. So ultimately, we chose this option. We chose to use the client-side option. Um, and in so doing, we wanted to use, wanted to build our own solution. So the natural question to that is, why not just choose the to choose an existing application that already lives out there. We mentioned Google Tink, there's Lipsodium, there's Bouncy Castle, Spongy Castle, all these different choices. And so there are many solutions that might satisfy our goals and requirements. Why build something new instead of using the existing solution? Another question we asked ourselves is, why wouldn't a service owner at Uber just use Lipsodium or XYZ tool directly? Why do we need a centrally managed solution? Well. As we showed in a previous slide, the Google machine is very complex. There's lots of different microservices, lots of different data stores, lots of custom data stores and logging systems. We can't always just take something off the shelf, whether it's free, open source, or commercial, and just add it to our environment and expect it to work. When we hear things like, oh, why don't you just use this or just use that? It's been our experience that that's not really viable. We can't use those right off the shelf. Additionally, with our own solution, we now have the ability to have a central place to audit. We mentioned earlier that we need to provide, uh, we need to satisfy regulations and compliance mandates. Well, using something like this, we can now do that. So my co-presenter Devo is gonna go through some of, that, some of those implementation details in the implementation section. So let's take a step into the design and figure out how we thought about designing this solution. So the things that we wanna talk about with design are gonna be what encryption strategy do we use? How do we configure it? And maybe some of the high level tech specifications for it. So the main strategy we're using is envelope encryption. Now, specifically we're using a symmetric key and we're using symmetric encryption with AES GCM. And this is mainly for our strategy of storing data in a database. We have other strategies like storing data in logs and setting data to third parties, but for the use case of storing data, storing data in a database, we're gonna use symmetric encryption and use an envelope encryption strategy.
for those that are, that are not familiar with that, all it really means is we have this, let's just call it a master key or a keck, so a key encrypting key. So we have this main key, and that key then generates, can, then we generate a ephemeral key, which we'll call a deck. Now, the keck is used to protect the deck by means of encrypting it, and then the deck is used to encrypt your plain text. So let's go over that one more time just to make sure we're all clear. We have a keck and we have a deck. The deck is used to encrypt your plain text, and then the keck is used to encrypt your deck. Now, what you do is you take your encrypted ciphertext and your encrypted deck and you store them in your database. So why is that important? Well, on the flip side, when we go to decrypt the data, if all that information lives in the data, uh, in, the, in the ciphertext, we can then use that, we can parse it and then decrypt the data. So let's talk a little bit about what the config looks like. We, we mentioned earlier that we wanted this solution to be config driven. So we have this notion of a namespace. A parallel analogy would be something like a, a key ring or, or key space. Uh, I think key ring is used more, more often in, in certain technologies. But what you have here is, is you have this kind of sandbox where you specify what's my KMS, what's my key, what's my cipher, and you could have multiple namespaces. But this namespace is used so when you go to encrypt a piece of data, our system can look up a namespace and say, oh, you're using this example namespace. Well, I know this example namespace uses AES GCM 256. I know that it uses ver a version three of a key. I know it uses a vault KMS. And so I have all of these kind of like key material or, or lookups to know what to how, how to, how to actually encrypt. When we talk about decrypt, we can have different versions of a key. So let's say, for example, we figured out that we want to rotate a key every year. So let's say we're in the third year of this process, and now we have three versions of the key. So in some cases, we'll, we'll have one active key that's used for encrypting, and then you'll have your older keys, like you know, version zero or version one, that are used to decrypt previously encrypted data. When we talk about algorithm, it's kind of implicit in, in this config, because this is the more basic config, but we're, we're able to specify which algorithm that we want to use. So again, if it's ASGCM 256, maybe it's uh, Cha Cha Poly, maybe it's something else, but we're able to specify this with our config. The last kind of um, config option we want to talk about is this notion of a key provider. A key provider is our abstraction on top of a KMS. So our goal for this, this solution is to create a create an abstraction layer such that you can use multiple KMSs. Let's say this year we use Vault, this year, next year we use AWS, and maybe the year after that we develop our own KMS. Each of those should be able to work independently of each other. And so for example, if this service, let's go back to our example of a user service, if they, over the last three years, use different key management systems and they've encrypted different data with different keys, they should still be able to decrypt all of their data and nothing really different should happen. I, I, as a service, should be able to call it decrypt, and then all my data gets magically decrypted. Last thing we'll talk about are the tech specs, um, specifically the language. So for the first iteration, we're focusing on Golang. That's primarily what we use for our backend services. And so we needed this solution that we're going to build to be in Golang. Um, we use a lot of dependency injection in our frameworks, and so we need to develop this solution such that we can expose constructors and interfaces um, in the DI model such that other modules can reuse those exposed constructors. We also wanted this to integrate with our, our logging and data store frameworks. So we use MySQL, we use some logging frameworks. We wanted to make sure that if I'm the user service, I can integrate this directly and just call our, our service, our encryption crypto effects service directly or I can leverage our data store framework. And then behind the scenes, the integration with crypto effects in the data store happens and automatically encrypts the data. So now that we've kind of talked about some of our goals, some of our requirements, some of our, our approaches that we considered and the result that we got, I'd like to pass it off to my co-presenter Devo to talk more about the implementation and how we actually arrived at solving these challenges.
So thanks, Jovan. Now we'll talk about how this client-side crypto solution is put together and how we deliberated about the knobs that we chose to expose to our end users. As we start talking about the implementation section, it's important to understand where we got started. Like many companies, Uber did not have a remote encryption service offering or even a formal remote KMS feature for that matter. Our uh, service secrets are mounted as files backed by a temp FS. So secrets are always only present in volatile storage. Very similar to what is um, offered by Kubernetes, if you all are more familiar with that environment. So there was a project being spun up to utilize slash productionize HashiCorp Vault's transit secret engine to serve as both a key management system as well as a remote encryption offering. Um, meanwhile, there was a multitude of business requirements that begged for a managed crypto offering in the short term. And uh, these requirements would have to be met before Vault uh, would be uh, truly fully productionized. As a result, we opted for a library design pattern that would currently utilize the secret delivery mechanism as a KMS, but also allow us to get to a world that is fully centrally managed uh, and it would offer encryption as a service, as a solution. Obviously, this would also require us to migrate keys over, but that is an operational issue we would deal with down the line. This is what the key provider component unlocks for us. The Cypher component gives us the flexibility to perform crypto operations with various algorithms, which is limited by the capabilities of the keys that are available to us. So both of these are knobs that can be controlled by the end user, albeit behind a set of same defaults. These are also hidden behind the core crypto interface, which is how we usually expect our service customers to interact with us. Now, we need to start thinking about where to encrypt and how to encrypt these blobs. So the main considerations that we should have are latency and performance. So nowadays, most implementations in languages like Golang are quite fast. So we'll only focus on the network latency aspect. On the security side, we'll consider how widely the keys are being shared and how many systems they are traversing through. On the operational complexity side, we'll measure the impact to the existing data access patterns, and we'll also consider how difficult it is to onboard to this new solution. Some further points to keep in mind here are, there will be services that have to deal with large um, message blobs. For example, if you want to store things like images um, encrypted in storage, or uh, services that usually deal with extremely high throughput traffic. So now let's uh, talk about what a truly local encryption solution would look like. In this case, the data encryption keys would essentially live on local and the encryption operations would also happen locally. And both of these things would remain contained to the current applications process. For the remote encryption option, everything would be completely remote where the data encryption keys would never really leave the boundaries of the encryption as a service. So the model of interacting with this is the library would simply send the blob that you want encrypted to this remote service and you would get a cipher text back. And then when you want to get the plain text again, you interact with that remote service. And as long as the person interacting has um, the reasonable access control set up, you should be able to get the plain text back. Then there's the hybrid model. This is where the end user has the ability to obtain a data encryption key from this remote service and then potentially uh, use the same data encryption key to encrypt one or more messages. And essentially they have the controls to refresh this data encryption key based on whatever interval they see fit. Nowadays, since most crypto operations take the order of microseconds, the only real latencies to consider here are the network latencies. That's why we offer um, all three of these options to the end user. 
Now let's start talking about the actual code that gets exposed to our customers. At Uber, as Jovan has mentioned in the past, we use a lot of dependency injection, um, both for Golang and Java, which are our primary languages. As a result, we envision this crypto module to be able to provide multiple small scoped interfaces that are geared to perform individual independent units of work. Our prioritization of this development work has always been driven by business requirements. And therefore, what we have here are the current set of interfaces that are provided by our crypto module. I'll go into some of the obstacles that we encountered along the way by virtue of everything being driven by business uh, requirements, in the, but that'll be in the next section, um, including some of the ways in which we had to rethink the interfaces to suit both internal only flows, as well as cases where um, data transmits beyond uh, the boundaries of Uber. So once we had the crypto interface out to a few customers, there came upon the need to be able to search over some encrypted records. In order to enable this, we built out a hasher interface to generate digests. The customer would then generate a digest for the field or string that they would like to encrypt. In parallel, they would also generate a ciphertext for that exact same field or string. Then both of these entries would get written to the database. The generated HMAC SHA-256 digest would be the deterministic component that would enable searchability, thus allowing the service to retrieve the relevant object from its data store. Um, the encrypted fields would then get decrypted using the normal techniques using the crypto I showed in the previous slide. So very soon we started to realize that while our same configuration driven defaults worked fairly well, um, they had made some interesting assumptions. Um, imagine if a service was performing a single type of a crypto operation, i.e. only local ops or only remote ops, or if it was using keys from a single namespace, everything worked great. But as soon as surveys started needing to deal with different namespaces, or if someone wanted to do both local and remote ops for different business flows, it became a problem. And the customers wanted to provide this information to this crypto FX library um, at the points at which uh, they were interacting with the real interfaces. And to enable this functionality, we built out these encryption options, which would essentially allow the customers to specify things like the namespaces or where certain encryption operations would happen. And they would be able to configure this at the call sites. So then we ended up instrumenting all of our top level interfaces, which were uh, exposed by this crypto FX module. This model made the interface methods much more extensible without us having to worry about significant breaking API changes in the future. <clears throat> in our world at Uber, we have made a large push towards monorepos recently. And as a result of this, many of these migrations, even in case of potential breaking API changes, the migrations can still be centralized, but we would still want to reduce unnecessary operational complexities as far as possible. So now let's talk a little bit about what the ciphertext that is returned by the crypto FX library looks like. For the general use case, all the fields that you can see in this slide are the ones um, we would need to be able um, to have the service uh, have the ability to decrypt a given ciphertext provided that they have access to all the keys. So some of the uh, things like the namespace is an identifier for how the keys are stored in either our local KMS or the remote KMS. Then we also have things like what cipher was used, some identification information for the key provider, key identities, etc. But these fields are only important for the local encryption use cases. If you think about it, for the remote use case, the only two pieces of information that we need are the key namespace and the base64 encoded ciphertext. So when a customer chooses to have remote encryption, those are the only two pieces of information that is contained in the ciphertext returned by crypto effects. And just based on those two pieces of information, they'll be able to obtain that plain text.
So now let's take another look at our scripture interface. <clears throat> In some cases, our consumers wanted to invoke the encrypt or decrypt options for a collection of attributes instead of on a per attribute basis. For example, when I'm trying to persist a user object and say, I need to encrypt the first and last names, I perhaps don't want or need to have a different data encryption key for each of those attributes. Therefore, we needed a way for the consumer to tell us which attributes needed to be encrypted using the same key for a given API call to the crypto interface. To enable this, we created the encrypt and decrypt struct interfaces, which were basically pretty wrappers on top of the standard encrypt and decrypt functions. But they have one special feature. We learned from the Golang standard library, the JSON, uh, the JSON encoding library that's exposed. We decided that struct tags would be a nifty way to achieve what we wanted. Very similar to the stuff Jovan talked about when discussing field level encryption. The idea would be generate a new key as soon as the function is called and then go around encrypting the relevant fields using that data encryption key. If you notice in the, uh, in the example, we can support encryption and decryption of strings and byte slices. The library also has the ability to be able to walk embedded structures. In some ways, you can think of this as a bulk encryption mechanism. When we get to implementing crypto effects in Java, we'd like to have a similar form of support. And for that, we'll think uh, of using uh, Java annotations. Next, uh, we'll chat a little bit about the challenges faced during the development process over the last uh, close to one year. Um, when encountering many of these challenges, right? The first thing that does come to mind usually is why not just use a standard library in this service to get past the current challenge and then we'll fix things in the future. At these times, it's important for us to take a step back to see if there's potential for us to make both our product better as well as to offer strategies to see if the customer could indeed migrate to a better, more reliable, more secure solution. <clears throat> thus improving their security posture. Now the points <clears throat> we have to be thoughtful about are, if we keep exposing a lot of knobs to the top level interfaces, we'd end up exposing interfaces very similar to what the standard libraries already do. And that's something we were trying to get away from. Since based on our research, we discovered that when a product engineering team implements a crypto solution, while it may meet the requirements at that point in time, it's often not quite extensible and more often than not make certain design decisions that compromise on both good security and reliability. Yes, the intent is there and that's wonderful, but the execution might not always be flawless. We also want to be able to provide reasonable defaults and safeguards coming from the security side to reach a world where the product teams experience in their interactions with um, all of the, uh, the developer platform teams, the infrastructure and security teams is both um, harmonious and frictionless. Yes, we acknowledge that the first few integrations will not be super smooth, but we want to get to a world where all the knobs uh, exposed by our, um, by our module are intuitive to the product teams and they get to enjoy development velocity without having to block on any of our core infrastructure focus teams. Taking uh, a little bit from some of the stuff Jovan talked about previously, our infrastructure is indeed quite unique. And I'd expect the internal infra of most large tech companies to be very similar. So in our experience of the shelf solutions, often do not work in our environment. Any proposed solution that usually begins with, why don't you just, in our experience, is usually just not viable. So when rolling out crypto products, there's a great need for developer evangelism. I will now go on to describe some of the different processes that we employed to help developers onboard to our crypto solutions. So uh, we provided white glove support to our first few customers, even onboarded a few of them ourselves. As a side note, this uh, did let us get acquainted with quite a few projects across 
Uber. We got to see some uh, interesting coding patterns and got to learn a lot. Uh, so this was absolutely excellent. Dealing with these customers directly also helped us understand these business use cases better and getting closer to these product and uh, product engineering teams um, and building strong relationships with them provided immense value to the business as well as uh, defined helped us define our future development roadmaps. So now to th think a little bit about the risks in when dealing with encryption things, um, if mistakes happen, data could potentially become irrecoverable. The customer doesn't know about the internals of our systems. And just because a certain encrypt operation worked error free doesn't mean that the decrypt operation would as well, especially for the alpha and beta customers. Then let's talk about coding patterns. Engineers more often than not grab around for code. So we'd like to get to a stage where they come across coding patterns that are aligned with our expected happy paths. So that way in the future, when an engineer is doing encryption things without interacting with the security team at all, they will be following the good patterns and the expected paths that we expect people to take. Now, there are uh, many times when compliance and regulatory requirements drive the crypto solutions for a certain product team. But other times we actually sit with our product partners to help explain the benefits of crypto and basically help them attain a better security posture. The, uh, one of the examples I just talked about was when we use that hasher interface to allow a team <clears throat> to essentially search over data that they had a compliance and regulatory obligation to store encrypted at rest. Other times, um, there are simply people that are very interested in security, and we absolutely love chatting with them. Then at Uber, we have a fairly robust SDLC at this point in time, including a very strong uh, design review process. So we try to identify cases where we can inject some, some of our crypto solutions very early in the design process. Um, and using this, this model, we get to, <clears throat> We get our engineers to start thinking about crypto very, very early, even during the documentation and design phases. So now at Uber, we get to see various data flow patterns. Um, there's the case of an external party sending data into Uber, services from inside Uber send, sharing data with various governments, third party vendors, etc and various internal to internal service uh, communications um, that may or may not ha have a requirement for field level encryption. Many of these patterns have been implementing using either uh, legacy libraries or um, various standard libraries. And these, are, these integrations always have various diverse ways. For the legacy library case, um, we went over a few options. Should we just support their usage patterns in our new library, we asked? Or does it make more sense to maintain a fork in the client service or to do a data migration if the ciphertexts aren't interoperable? For bespoke and diverse users of standard library encryption products, we ended up with a similar solution set. So finally, we decided on the combination of the latter two options. If the service owner isn't willing to dedicate the time now, maintain a fork in their code, but communicate clearly that data inconsistencies or support related to old solutions will not be provided by the team managing the central solution. Apart from this, we offer all customers that are custodians of large data sets of encrypted messages, a solution that entails either a read repair strategy or a process to have background jobs go and encrypt all their old data. Generally, our strategy is to help everyone get over to the managed central offering that has not just security, but code logging and auditability requirements built in. So next, this in this section, I'll try to talk a little bit about the work that we intend to do um, over the upcoming few months. So one of them, as I had mentioned before, we need to work on importing some of the local keys from this local KMS of ours 
to a, to the remote um, HashiCorp Vault KMS uh, to uh, further uh, limit the key exposure problem. Then in order to help some of our internal customers migrate to a new solution from old uh, from either old uh, legacy softwares or from standard library implementations, we'd like to provide some more uh, knobs and features for uh, in our top level interfaces uh, to satisfy the various encoding and encryption requirements. So, CryptoFX currently lacks a high level signer and verifier interface. In general, uh, companies like Uber, we host a lot of content behind cloud CDNs. Um, but most of our URL signing capabilities are bound by the support that's usually provided by these CDNs uh, and their respective SDKs. For example, products like AWS's CloudFront still only supports RSA verification. Hence, we cannot migrate to a solution that's based on EC keys, even though significant, uh, signature generation is significantly faster. Regardless, we'd like to get these interfaces out there and getting used so that when the time comes and when the appropriate support is present, we have a fairly centralized way to bump everyone to the more computationally economical solutions. So now uh, to talk a little bit more about searching over uh, encrypted records. These have always been things that we have wanted to build, but they have always gotten deprioritized due to other work that has come up. So one of those things is fully homomorphic uh, encryption, but one of the problems with this approach would be um, that while this is great for a distributed integrity checking uh, problem space, this wouldn't be a great fit for most of Uber's use cases, given the linear nature of having to go through all the records to be able to find the ones we are interested in. Then there is property preserving encryption. So this could be a combination of two things, either equality preserving or order preserving, but due to the very nature of uh, of these systems, uh, similar to the points we discussed before, um, these methods are fundamentally susceptible to inference attacks, which are further exacerbated if you're dealing with low entropy data, like either social security numbers or credit card details. Um, then there's also functional encryption. In theory, it's uh, kind of same, uh, the operational nature is kind of similar to what you'd see in homomorphic encryption. Uh, in the sense, it's going to be very slow since you have to go over all the records that you have um, present in your data store systems to be able to find whichever records actually um, match your expected query patterns. So yeah, this is basically what we have um, for you all for today. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen.